uh, every, everyone who's watching, uh, thank you very much for coming to this month's uh, SF Scala Meetup. Tonight we have one of our, uh, tonight we have uh, Sandy Verdi who has done a talk with us before back to do a great talk on QR key value store with MVCC based transaction systems. There you go. I hope I got that right. Over to you, Sandy. <clears throat> Hello and welcome everyone to Scala SF Meetup. Uh, my name is Sandeep. Um, thank you everyone for taking the time to attend this talk. A special talk, a special thanks to Solar for organizing, organizing this meetup. Um, today I'm going to be talking about Kiara Key Value Store. It's an MVCC based transaction system. So motivation, I've been interested in databases and how they work. Um, last year, I got my hands on this paper mentioned in the slide. After reading it, I wanted to implement it. Disclaimer, I'm not a database expert by any means. There is 50 plus years of literature out there. Um, if, I do, if I do make a mistake, um, do feel free to correct me at the end. Um, it's a learning experience for me as well. I'll try to add all the links that I've used in this slide, um, at, at the end in a slide. Uh, since I do not want to assume anybody has read the paper, I want to build up some context and then work towards the algorithm described in the paper. I've split the, the talk in sections and hopefully that would make this talk more approachable. So the first section is, we'll, we'll look at how things are done on a disk-based systems. And for this, we'll look at how Postgres handles things. Then, we could look at format. In our case, it's columnar format. And then we could look at what Apache Arrow brings to the table. Then we look at the various components from the paper. Um, then we could look at the implementation in Scala. If time permits, we could look at what, what, how, and we could talk a little bit about Zio and what it has to offer. And if we really have some time, then we could look at like improvements, what I've learned, um, et cetera. So context, let's look at a small demo. Um, I'm gonna present my terminal now, and I would like if anybody could not see, if I would like everyone to let me know that they could see my terminal and the fonts are fine. If anybody could let me know that it's fine, then I could proceed. I can, I can see the terminal. Uh, I guess make the fonts a little bit bigger if you can, for people with a smaller screen than mine. Thanks. Is that good? Yeah, yeah, I, like I said, if anyone okay. uh, thinks it should be better on Twitch, let me know. Yeah, please feel free to let me know. I could wait. Um, but this is just a regular Postgres database. I, I have a Tmux on, two sessions on. Um, so let's, let's do this. Um, so I'm going to create a simple table and add some data to it. Um, it's nothing special here. So I'm going to start a transaction with isolation level serializable. And let's do a simple select. Um, you can see the contents of the tuple again, nothing special here. So let's do something a little bit interesting. Let's try to get the X min and X max. So databases have internal metadata that they use to keep track of copies or versions of tuples that they create during transactions. In Postgres, these are called X min X packs. These values usually get populated by transaction that last process they supples. X max, you can think of X max equal to zero here represents infinity. So one way to think about it is 755 was the last transaction or timestamp uh, of a transaction that updated this tuple. And this is open till infinity. We, and we'll get more into what these things mean uh, in, in, in later slides. So let's look at the transaction ID or the um, timestamp ID. Um, so you'll notice that the, so think of transaction ID as a logical timestamp, not wall clock timestamp. Um, here, timestamp here, here you could think of timestamp as a monotonically increasing number 
even if it says transaction ID, if you think about it as timestamp, it'll help uh, when we talk about the paper and how it's doing its, uh, its, its serialization and ordering. Um, okay, so let's do something a little bit interesting and let's try to update a tuple with ID one. All right, so now let's try to do select again, but this time with CT ID. So if you, if you look at the X min here and you see the, the timestamp ID is the, the current timestamp ID for the transaction that actually is being used in the X min. Um, and that, that tells us that this, this physical version was updated by this at this timestamp in this transaction. Um, okay, so the CD ID here shows the page and offset at which this new tuple lives. So the CD ID is something new, and this is the this represents the page and this represents the offset. All right, so let's do this. Let's start another transaction in the terminal below. Let this also be at isolation levels realizable. <laughs> so each transaction is creating a new version of the tuple or the database object. The way to prove this assertion is to print out the CD, CTID in this new transaction. So let's go ahead and do just that. And long behold, we are, we are selecting the same tuple um, and here you can see the ID. But if you if you look carefully, the CD ID and the page offset is different than this one. So the page is the same, but the offset at which this tuple lives is is completely different. Excuse me. All right. So let's look also at the timestamp here, and it is as you can see, it's last was two fifty six. Now it's two fifty seven. And it, could be, it, it holds with that assumption that it's a monotonically increasing number. All right, so I'm going to do an update in the transaction in the, in the, lower, in the lower window. Does anyone, can anyone guess what the result of this is going to be? I'm gonna to try to update the same tuple with ID one. Um, all right, I'm, because this is not that interactive, I'm going to do it. Um, and if you see the current thread is blocked. So the main takeaway here is writers don't block readers. Readers don't block writers, but writers do block writers. Okay, so let's do this. Let's commit the transaction that's running in the upper window. Um, can anyone guess what will happen to the transaction below? If I commit this transaction, um, all right, let me just do it. All right, so you see that we, we encounter the serialized access due to concurrent update error, which is what we expected because of the isolation level. So the, the gist of this is that you're not allowed to create new versions from an uncommitted transaction and so, so and, and another one is the fact that the, tr the database was holding an exclusive lock on the tuple when we are doing these transactions. Um, all right, so now that we have that done, let's, um, let's do another, let's do another small demo. So I'm going to create the database, uh, the tables again, and add the values. And okay, and so let's do let's do a simple selects. I hope by now everybody knows that what x min, x max, the CTID represents. Um, all right. So now again, let's start a transaction at isolation level serializable in the upper window, right? And let's go ahead and start the transaction at the read uncommitted at the, in the lower window. So just FII, read uncommitted, that's the key here. Um, all right, so let's do a select. 
so that we see that the data is identical. There's nothing um, monkey going on. All right, so let's go on the about terminal. Let's do an let's do a update at let's do an update for for tuple with ID one. Again, nothing special. And then let's check our result. And we see that the ID one has been updated. Um, let's come down and let's do an update on the tuple with ID two, right? You see that here. Now let's do, so again, a question here. If I run this select in this transaction, um, what would be the result? Um, let me just run it and let's let, let's look at these results. So the transaction sees its own rights, right? We, we, we updated the ID two and we see that it's being updated, but it still sees the, for ID one, it sees the original level even though we are running under isolate, isolation level read uncommitted, we should actually be seeing this value since this was just, this was just created uh, in the transaction. What this tells us that Postgres is running at a higher isolation level, even if you actually ask it to run at a lower isolation level. So another way to understand this, which is important for understanding the paper, is like these ranges add validity. And they, they, they add a validity range, a begin and end validity range to these database objects. Um, this begin and end define the, the, you can think of the big, the begin and end define the validity range of this physical versions of the logical object, because we are not changing the actual objects until we commit. So these are just like, uh, logical objects till we commit. Um, hopefully this, this gives, this, this, this gives you some context, how things are done on, on this space databases. So I'm going to go back and. I'm going to go back to my slides and share. Uh, let me do that. All right. Okay. So I hope this gives uh, some idea about how database systems manage versions of data objects and their visibility. Um, they're under underneath the hood. They're actually using metadata like timestamps during transactions. Um, so let's focus back to the paper, pull each component apart and try to understand them. Let's begin with the main memory column store format. Um, so main memory store format, before we look at uh, the, the, the store format, let's look at a very, very, very high level how this based systems, database systems work. Um, database disks, index, buffer pools, etc. store data in fixed length structures called pages. So buffer pool is a cache that actually moves the data between the disk and the main memory. So whenever a query is executed, we check the index, get the page ID, and look up the page in the buffer pool if it's not present and get it from disk. Like any other cache pool, it has like eviction policies, and this could get tricky and we're dealing with 30 pages because now we need to flush them to disk before eviction. So in general, let me get the pointer. In general, when you get a query, you look up the index, it'll give you some, some page. You go try to fetch the page. If it's not in the buffer pool, go get from disk. If it's, if, if the buffer, and you bring it back into buffer pool, if the buffer pool being a cache if it needs to evict something, now it needs to think about uh, which page to evict. Uh, and this gets trickier if you have read uh, 30 pages because of like un uncommitted transactions. And then if everything is good, you return back the, the data to, to the consumer. 
Um, this this complexity of uh, how trans this complexity is also seen in transactions and concurrency control, um, um, and, and so and 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 you you also need to keep this extra metadata about where the page resides, whether the page resides on this or in the buffer pool cache. Is it dirty? Is it not? Um, we have not even talked about the LSN database objects and other database processes. We can skip that for now. Um, this is an oversimplification, but I hope this helps to give some context of um, how this space systems work in, uh, under the hood. Um, most of the issues described here will not be relevant to the in-memory data store or in-memory database. So the main memory store format. So irrespective of a row or a columnar format in memory database, in, in an in memory database, you're going to organize the data in, in chunks. Let's call them blocks. And these blocks will typically hold two kinds of data. One is fixed length, another one is variable length. Your fixed length being in date, long, etc., and variable variable length being variable binary, etc. Um, Again, at a very high level, when you execute a query, it's going to return it's going to return a logical ID from which you could get the block ID and the offset, and then which you could use to get the data from the underlying data store. So again, you have the index. You ask the index. It will look up and it'll give you a logical ID. And the logical ID you could split and get the the block, in which data resides and from the block. You could get calculate the offset, because that's also part of the index, and then you could return the data back. So the main issues that you'll encounter in an in-memory database, in-memory in databases are pointer chasing, cache line misses, data copying, et cetera, which are, very, which are quite different from disk-oriented databases. Uh, a point that I want to highlight in the slide is variable length blocks need another layer of indirection we actually store the value in a separate memory location. We then take that memory location and add that to a fixed length block and then store that in an index. So there's a layer of indirection. And I, I hope that it, it is understood why it exists. If not, we could talk about it in the, at the, after the, after the uh, talk. All right. So Apache Arrow, um, definition from straight from the website, Apache Arrow defines a language independent columnar memory format for flat and hierarchical data organized for efficient analytic operations on modern hardware like CPU and GPUs. Apache Arrow memory format also supports zero copy reads for lightning fast data access without serialization overhead. When I first read the paper, one of the bi biggest barriers to implement it was the in-memory columnar format described in the paper. After a bit of searching, I found out about Apache Arrow. So Apache Arrow is an umbrella project with a lot of sub-projects, and one of them being a columnar format. You could read the specification online. <clears throat> Excuse me. So vectors. So the main abstraction in Apache Arrow are vectors. There are two base vectors, base fixed width vector that is used to define, and sorry, base fixed width vector and variable width vector that, that can be used to define all the value types that a column store can support. So let's look at the source code of, of, of one of the vectors defines a concept of validity buffer. Let's examine how it's tied to the paper. Every fixed width or variable length vector has a value buffer and a validity buffer. If you look at this, there's a validity buffer and a value buffer. Uh, this is the internal state of every, uh, I'm showing only fixed width vector, but it's the same for the variable width vector as well. <clears throat> 
So the, the, the value buffer is used to store the values, but the validity buffer stores the information whether a value is present at an index or is null. Furthermore, it can do this very cheaply since effectively it's a bit set. So validity buffer. If, if you read the paper in, in section 2.6, it talks about efficient scanning, which is highlighted in the slide uh, as, as version positions. So version position represent ranges inclusive of start and exclusive of end. If we say if you have a column that has 10,000 elements, but in reality, there are elements present from one to 100 and from 9,000 to 10,000. Without any knowledge, if you scan the whole column, you will end up facing CPU cycles and also incurring a lot of cache misses. This is where validity buffers come into play. Since they are very small, they could fit into the cache lines and you could generate the version positions on the fly uh, or even maintain them on the side, thus boosting the scanning efficiency. So if you we, if we look at the paper, <clears throat> they are described on this top left-hand corner. Um, so let's say that we have this column that has the names of all the users. And let's say that these, this column is chunked into blocks uh, shown here. Currently, there are three blocks shown in the paper. So the version position here gives us the information that in the first block, there is no element present. In the second block, there is one element present, and that's also represented by this, this arrow here. In the third block, we see that there are two elements present, and these are also shown by these arrows here. We'll talk more about this uh, structure later in the, in the slides. <coughs> um, but this is where the concept of validity buffer is so helpful. You get the version position functionality almost for free via validity buffers when you use uh, Apache Arrow. Okay, Delta storage. If you recall the demo about Postgres, we saw that the transactions were creating a new physical version of the tuple at some new location every time the transaction is executed. This new location is called Delta storage. Let's try to understand what a version vector is and how it's tied to a Delta storage. So let's take a quick look at how the complete record, uh, the complete database record is returned. Um, so given a key in, in a, in a row-based format, given a key will jump to some memory location of, from which you can calculate the width of the, of the row, and then you can return the whole row. Um, in a columnar layout, given a key, you'll need to jump at individual indexes in each column, build out the whole record, and then return it. So keep this notion of building the, the record by jumping at individual locations in mind, because this will help us in understanding a few other things down in the slides. So let's say we have a transaction T that affects a row with T and tuples. Um, uh, with T and tuple. We copy the tuples in the new location, <clears throat> excuse me, call the Delta storage and proceed with the transaction. This model seems to be fine if you're dealing with the Robis format, um, but and, and relation, in relational databases usually do not have uh, wide rows. So this might just work out fine. So in this example, given the transaction T, even if the tuple is, is if, if say you have tuples T1, T2, up to Tn, even if you want to work with tuples, say just the attributes tuple one, two, and three, given the nature in which we access this information, you might just end up reading the whole row. 
Um, if you recall about the whole idea of storing these things in pages, um, this, that, that will help understand why I'm saying what I'm saying. And you, you might just, you just end up copying the whole row in the, in the Delta storage and work from there. Now imagine a columnar layout. If we had a table with hundred columns and say only two columns participated in a transaction, then we do not need to copy all the other values. Instead, we copy only the deltas involved, i.e. the tuples and their updates. To better manage the idea of delta storage in a columnar database, the paper introduces a concept or an indirection layer called version vector. A version vector is a structure that's shared across all columns in the database. For example, a table with 100 columns, there will only be one version vector. Additionally, it, it's only used during transactions. If you look at the slide inside the Delta storage, a transaction T1, we, we only copy tuples T2, T3, and T10, and their updates, and this forms the Delta version record. So here, given a column with tuples T1, T2, Tn, when we copy the, during the actual transaction, we only copy the tuples T2, its update, T3, its update, and T10, and its update in the Delta storage. And the, we, we use the version vector as a pointer to this entry. So this complete structure is called a Delta version record, and we'll talk more about this. So, if you recall the whole idea of writers do not block readers and readers do not block writers, by adding this layer of indirection, we are effectively limiting the scope and the surface area of synchronization. <coughs> Excuse me. So if say it topples T2, T3, T10 that are participating in a transaction you could still have your reader zip through the whole column um, except for these three attributes and work with that data without being bothered by ever uh, synchronizing on this data. Um, and we saw how during transactions, the, the, the transactions had an exclusive lock on the object uh, that we were working with in a database system. Um, so now that we have some more context about these things, so let's see what we have covered so far. We, we, we have some knowledge about Delta storage, a place where new tuple versions are stored for the lifetime of the transaction, a version vector, a structure described in the paper that helps print transactions in Calmer database, and a Delta version record that contains all the attributes and updates during a transaction. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when transactions are taking place concurrently, we could end up with a chain of Delta version records pointing to each other. If you look at the figure in the slide, the version vector, the version vector entry is pointing to a linked list of Delta records. These records are ordered by timestamps and there are two, there are a couple of ways to order these, these records. One is oldest to newest and the other one is newest to oldest. Uh, the paper actually talks about ordering these timestamps from newest to oldest. So during transaction, we land on an up there. We just got there, either it was an index or maybe it was sequential scan. The entry in the version vector is null. The column is not, the column, this column has not yet participated in any transactions. If it be, so the first thing we do is we copy the, the Delta record into the Delta version vector, proceed with the transaction. If the version vector entry is not null, we know that there is a pointer to a linked list of Delta version records. We do some validation and append an entry to the head of the chain. So this is the version vector. If you see, if the pointer is to a null, that means the, this column has not participated in transactions. You copy, you create a new Delta record and you 
copy it into the Delta version record. If it points to a linked list of Delta records, then you do some validation and add them to the list. So if you look at the previous slide, we, ha we had this transaction and we had these tuples in it. This is nothing but each tuple now is, sorry, the, this group of tuple in T1, this is what the Delta record is. All right, <laughs> excuse me. Version maintenance. Let's look at the Delta version record entry format. Each entry has a start and end timestamp, a value and a transaction ID and some other metadata fields. I'm not adding, I haven't added transaction ID here. Um, usually transaction ID is of type long. This is to mitigate the whole wraparound issue. For example, in Postgres, the transaction ID is 32 bits and you have 4 billion IDs. If you do not run vacuum, you will end up wrapping around and now the transactions in the past will start to appear as if they are in the future. Uh, the paper talks about drawing the start and the end timestamp from the same global counter to help with this realization order. Um, just a hint that we, we, we saw the same in Postgres as well, where we had the monotonically increasing number, the timestamp number, the X min and X max. So say that this is the, so say that this is the, this, so 50 to infinity represents the latest Delta record entry. Uh, its predecessor here is 30 to 50 and its predecessor is 20 to 30. <laughs> So say a transaction at timestamp 65 uh, comes into this uh, version vector and starts to look for a Delta entry to use. It'll come and look at the head. The 65 is between 50 and infinity. So it'll choose this Delta entry and use that for its transaction. Say another transaction with timestamp 45 comes comes to this version vector and starts going up the chain. So it'll first look between 45, 45, so it'll first look between 50 and infinity, it'll fail. 45 is between 30 and 50, so it'll end up choosing this Delta record and it'll proceed with the transaction. So in the previous transaction, we saw the Delta record entry this is what a Delta, a Delta record entry looks like. So I hope you are slowly building up uh, with these concepts. Um, all right. So version maintenance, concurrency, and visibility. So let's talk about concurrency visibility of the Delta version entries. <clears throat> the, the slide shows that the state of the version vector for, for, for an attribute, say column A. Now we do, we do support speculative reads, i.e. uncommitted reads. Say we have three transactions in the system. How do these transactions keep track of which Delta entries were committed? <clears throat> say you have these three transactions. Say this transaction started at 65. So it gets this entry. Transaction two started at 45, gets this entry, but there is no notion of committedness attached to the entry itself. These entries are not tagged in any way. So one way to do it would be to have an external data structure to store metadata about the, the, the committedness or whether the, the Delta entries are committed or not. But now, all transaction, transaction validation process, redo log, garbage collection, et cetera, need to access this data structure. This, this, this structure will end up requiring a lot of synchronization. It will have a lot of contention, which is not a good idea for a um, in-memory database. So the, the, the golden rule of anything in memory is the is represented by the acronym CREAM, cash rule, anything around me. 
Um, so if we go back one slide and we see that, you know, say that we, we have the transactions 65 um, accessing this Delta version entry, and then we add that uh, metadata in this data structure, well now this, this will be accessed not only by transaction uh, three, but also two, one, could be one as well. It could also be, it, 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 it also be, it will also be accessed by the validation process. It'll also be accessed by the redo log. And soon this will become the bottleneck uh, and, and source of contention. Um, so contention on external data structure means a lot of cache misses. And this is a big no-no for in-memory databases. And if, if folks are interested, we could talk more at the end of, at the, end of the talk. Um, about the latest uh, like the design that we folks are trying to do and achieve with all new, new infrastructure coming into play or hardware coming into play. Version maintenance, concurrency and visibility. So let's look at this version vector again. If this is the current state of a version vector, the latest entry as shown by uh, star timestamp 30 and end timestamp infinity <clears throat> Let's say that there is a new transact, new write transaction in the system, and we want other read transactions to read the new version that will be created by this write transaction. But also maintain the notion that the newly committed version is not yet committed. Newly created uh, entry is not yet committed. What I mean by that? So say that this is the state. Uh, say a transaction at timestamp 45 comes in, it's a right transaction. It'll copy this value, create a new entry here, and it'll start working with that. Then there's another transaction that comes in at say 50, and it uses this slot, and it uses the previous value. But we, we, we want the, the, the new read transaction to be able to know when this right transaction was, was uh, the, the, the transaction at timestamp 45 was committed so that it, it, it knows when it can commit. And this is important during the validation phase in a transaction's lifetime. <coughs> it needs this information, otherwise it'll need to abort or retry. All right, so the way to accomplish this is to first create a new version entry, take the start timestamp from the new entry and add it as an end timestamp to its predecessor. Now make sure that the start timestamp of the new entry and the end timestamp of the predecessor both have the MSB, the most significant bit flipped, or they are negative as shown in the slide. Now we do not need any external data structure to keep the information about uncommitted versions. All the information is present within the timestamps. And since timestamps are 64 bit, they follow the golden rule of cache friendliness. During the transaction commit st step or phase, we do need to check whether the delta entries processed by this transaction, whether they were committed or not. If yes, then go ahead and commit. If not, either reschedule, retry again, or report based on the kind of transaction we are dealing with. So again, so this was the previous state of our version vector. Say a new transaction came in at timestamp 50, and we, we got the new transaction has timestamp 50. So what we'll do is, because it's a right transaction and it's not yet committed, we will flip the first bit of the right of the of the uh, start timestamp, add the the same value up as the end timestamp of this uh, previous or its predecessor. Close the, the the validity range, and this is now the new validity range for this transaction. Mind you, it's this is all the information that we need uh, uh, when we need to know whether this. Delta version entry is committed or not. It stands on its own. <clears throat> Excuse me. So 
say now we are at the point where we can commit a transaction at that point we come back and we say we this transaction the the transaction that's at the start timestamp of 50 um it is it, it gets a commit timestamp of 65 at that point we come back we 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 update the timestamp of this delta version entry to be 65 without the negative sign and also update this entry and add 65 without the negative sign. Mind you, still the ranges hold, the validity has not changed for this value or this delta record is still valid within the same range as it was uh, when we were looking at when we, when we were looking at it at uh, minus 50 or 50 times 50. So a, a, a few observations um, during transactions, first writer always wins. And we saw that in our Postgres example as well. Remember isolation levels realizable. If you try to update a value that is being updated by another transaction, you're bored. So in here, say that we are, uh, we, there's a, this is the current state of the version vector. A new transaction comes in, a write transaction with a timestamp 65. It cannot use this value and try to use it in its transaction. Why? Because that might result in cascading upwards, which is again, a bad idea for uh, in, in, in memory database. Um, and generally it's, it's, it's a performance bottleneck. And it has implica implications not only in, in the commit phase, but also redo in the validation phase and the redo, redo log phase and um, other database processes as well, even in during garbage collection. So to make things simpler, uh, this is the, this is the simplest approach that's, that, that's mentioned or applied. Um, so the, the, so the database that's based on the paper that's described uh, in, in, that, that I had linked in the, in the slide is called Hyper. Um, it does not have write-write conflicts because all the writes are single-threaded. And we could talk more about this again at the end. Uh, I don't want to get into that right now. Yeah, um, and okay, we've already talked about cascading awards. <laughs> Excuse me, let me just have order. <sighs> All right. <clears throat> Apologize. Okay, precision locking. So precision locking is a very old technique described in a paper from 1981. The basic idea of this technique is to validate the predicates present in a transaction. So say that you have two transactions and they have a where clause um, and each where clause will produce a predicate space. If there's an intersection between these two predicate space uh, with the transaction that is we're against the, with the transaction T that we're validate, validating it against, we abort the transaction. <clears throat> if you look at this slide uh, we, where there are four predicates there are four predicate spaces mentioned here, um, and we're trying to validate a transaction T. These four predicate spaces were selected because they were generated by the transactions that completed during the, the lifetime of transaction T. So here, you see that we have predicate space, <coughs> excuse me, P1, P2, P3, P4, and we're trying to validate a transaction, and we see that there is an intersection with the data object present in this predicate space, so we abort. The paper talks about creating a predicate tree by merging the nodes if they have a common node. If you look at the predicate P2 and P4, they share the same node, hence they can be merged as shown by the image on the right. So here, if you look at P2 and P4, they have a common node B, so they get merged here, and we say it's it's an and. So we 
15 and i equal to 1, p15 and i equal to 1.7. Um, right. So for the transaction t to be valid, its predicate space should not intersect with p1 or p2 or p3 or p4. If we squint, we realize that we're dealing with Boolean algebra here, and we could use De Morgan's law to boost the performance of the precision locking at the implementation. Um, yeah, but now we are entering the domain of query optimization, uh, which is a field in itself, and I'm going to skip it for now. Um, so how do we generate this predicate space? Um, during transactions, we add delta version records to an undo buffer. And we need to do this to support the redo log. Um, we, can we can reuse the undo buffer to generate the read set, pre, i.e. pre-images um, of the data objects. Um, and for the right transactions, we also need the post images or the values after the update. An observation about precision locking is, um, we do not do serializability checks on the record level, but we do this at the attribute level. This makes it cheaper and, and, and more accurate, less false positives. So if you, if you think about an example where you have the same tuple that's participating in two transactions, but the two transactions are <coughs> updating two completely different attributes of that tuple. Um, theoretically, you should not have any conflict, but most validation, most databases in the validation phase will be too conservative and they will abort those transactions more often than not. All right, let's look at some code. Um, let me share my IntelliJ, then we could look at the implementation. And now we could try to try to tie it back to the, oh, but sorry about that. Sorry, but can, you, can everyone still hear me? I got disconnected for a second. I wasn't sure what happened, but yeah, we, we can see you. You just stopped sharing your screen. Uh, I okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Is is this fine? Can everybody see this? Yep. <clears throat> looks good to me. Yes. If anyone on Twitch, if it's not okay for you guys, let me know, and I can ascend it to make it bigger. But looks looks good to me. Thank you. All right. So <clears throat> let's start with the 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 column abstraction. So it has some internal state, which I'm going to not talk about. Um, so you could initialize it. Currently, it supports in, float, and big int. Uh, it's protected, so you could easily override it. So there is some internal state. I'm going to skip all this. This is not. And this this is nothing new or interesting. Let's look at get instead. <clears throat> so one thing I do want to mention is that the the column is generic in A and B where A is constrained as a subtype of the base width vector. Um, so this is why when we are reading, we need this uh, and, and implicit evidence that we could read this, this um, base width vector and return this value to the consumer. Um, so when, when you get a logical index, you create, you get the, the, the the block and the offset um, from the, so you get the index and the offset, you get the block, and then you read from the block the offset and you return it. Um, I hope this is this this is uh, pretty straightforward. There's nothing, like folks who know Scala, there's nothing um, special. But if anybody wants to talk about this, we could talk later at the end of the, at the end of the talk. Similarly for set, uh, again, get the index and the value. We do the same, we get the block, we then write it, and there's a corresponding write. Now, hopefully this is clear why we have A and B, and we do the same. Um, the only difference is uh, 
If the block is full, you do some internal state change and you update the blocks. All right, so one thing that I do want to mention, I don't know if I'll get time to talk about Zio, but this is a pretty cool uh, abstraction from Zio. It comes from the STM package. Um, it's, it's, I, I, it, I highly recommend folks to go at least check it out. Um, so the, the way this works is you could have multiple readers, but one writer. And the logs that you create, you could promote a reader to writer and, uh, and, and, and yeah, in a, in a critical section, you could do that. Uh, it's based on a paper, uh, but I'll let folks do that. I, I don't want to digress too much into this. Um, so that's the, the column abstraction. Let's look at the, the store abstraction. Um, all right. So, so the store is basically what we call a table in, um, a, in a database. Um, what this is, it has a, some internal state, but it's storing the column name and the column. Um, you could create a column and add it to the store, and then you could get the value out of the map or out of the store, given the key, excuse me, given the key. Um, so one interesting thing about this is the, the, the storing the value as any, uh, but effectively this map is actually a heterogeneous map. <coughs> Excuse me. Where we are storing different kinds of um, columns um, to make the, the, uh, the column or to, to, add, add, to make the, this abstraction of get column more type safe, I'm using this thing from Shapeless called Typeable uh, that helps with um, runtime casting or type safe casting. Um, it's, it's, it's actually a pretty neat trick. What it does is it has A and B. You create typables for that. And then you just ask, if you check whether it's an instance of the, the column that, or the, the type that you're matching against. If it is, you cast it. And then you again, you need uh, default values or values of that type and you try to cast them. If they all work, then you return them as an instance. Uh, and given that these are in the flop, for block, if any of this fails, it will just escape and it will fail and we'll get an option, uh, uh, we'll get a run back. Um, all right, so this is uh, store. Let's look at store. Let's look at something different here. So this is basically a map of uh, key to delta version vector. I think uh, the only thing that I want to highlight here is this notion of composite key. And we will come back to this. Um, all right, delta version vector. Um, so, <laughs> excuse me, let me just. Sorry about that. So the paper describes the version vector as a data structure that points to a linked list um, of Delta version records participating in the transaction. Effectively, what you have is a lookup by some key to get to a list, um, which this list in the end is again a list. So, um, so if you remember the whole um, the, the, the transaction having tuples and then the, the transaction, the data, the, the data entry, the data entry nodes actually forming a link list, but the data entry itself could have tuples in it uh, that participate in the transaction. So you have a link list inside a link list. Um, the, data the data structures mentioned in the paper are cast based. These are, these are all the operations that they perform the pointer updates are, are uh, based on CAS. Um, doing operations on nested lists in JVM is tricky. So a simple workaround, I came up with a simple workaround. So the first key insight here is that the lookup is by a key. So you need to some, side of, some sort of map. Um, the second is that the value itself is dynamic. So remember 
not all columns participate in transaction. So you want the inner structure to be dynamic as well. So effectively, now what we want is a map or tree, uh, the inner structure to be a map or tree. So now we have converted the problem from a nested list to a nested map, uh, which quite frankly doesn't seem any better. Um, but uh, there's a very simple trick, or very general trick that you could use. You could flatten the map if you, if you change the structure of the key. Um, and this is where the composite key comes into play. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we will look uh, in the, like, it, we'll, we'll look why it's important and how it helps us solve the implementation as well. Um, so let's look at the transaction implementation. Um, so you could think about the slice transaction as the as effectively a read transaction. And there's a counterpart to this that's a write transaction. And whenever there's any difference, I'll highlight in the write transaction bit what, what's, what, whatever is different. So let's go up. Let's look at the, as, <clears throat> again, this is, there's some internal state. For now, let's not worry ourselves with all that. So let's go to the, the start. So, <clears throat> so when, when we start the transaction, we register it, we have a ledger and this ledger is basically um, storing the recently committed transactions and active transactions. So we register ourselves with the ledger, then we search for entries. So one interesting thing uh, is when you Given an ID, how do you know when to read the, the value from the column? Or you go ahead and read the value from the version vector, or you start searching the, the linked list for the, for the, for the, 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 the correct value. So <clears throat> the, for that, there is, in, in the paper, it described a check called in-place version check. Actually, I came up with this name, but it, it's a very simple check all it does is we check whether the current transaction id is equal to the end timestamp or if it's greater we know that there is since we are ordering all our entries in the linked list by newest to oldest if this condition fails, we know that you know the latest entry is actually in the uh, column itself, not in the version vector. <coughs> and I hope by now everyone, or hopefully, understands why we have this absolute here, because we could have negative values in the timestamps. Okay, so so we do this. Another interesting bit about uh, the whole flattening of map of maps. So the paper describes the version vector as a pointer to a linked list, but it doesn't describe how the entries in the linked list should appear. Um, if you went with the regular linked list, then you could have the pointer for the key to a heterogeneous list where you first have to search the column that uh, you're trying to look for the entry for, and then you've got to work from there towards which entry uh, actually satisfies uh, these validation rules. Anyway, so this is the in-place version check. Say if it succeeds, uh, say if he says, okay, we got to read the column on true, we go and co copy the first, the, the first thing that we do when we, if the, if the column has not yet participated in a transaction, is we create a Delta version entry, we update some state, um, and then we return. But let's look at this bit because this is interesting. Um, and this is where we are adding undo buffer uh, entry into the undo buffer. This could also be used for building the redo log, which is for the 
for recovery. Um, so this is where we add the call. This is where we are collecting the pre images or uh, uh, this is where we're collecting the pre images for the validations uh, state. So let's look at this. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this is a very simple case class. Um, but the interesting bit here is the roaring bitmap. Uh, if you, if you, uh, this actually is an open spec. A lot of data processing frameworks use this. You, any, if you just go to, if you search for roaring bitmap, uh, you'll end up on their website and you could read about it. Uh, I don't want to go too much into detail, but it has really, really interesting, cool applications. One that I really like is where uh, the Golang version, um, they created a, a, a search engine uh, using roaring bitmaps, um, which is insanely fast for 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 some use cases. Um, and if you, if you see the internal structure of these things, it's basically a bit set. And why they're insanely fast for few use cases is because of this, is this internal structure. Um, anyway, so we, we store these values, these before images into our bitmap then we could actually use these for doing our Boolean algebra uh, and do the validation there to check if there's any intersection. This is, you get all that functionality for free if you're using uh, an abstraction like this. Otherwise, you have to hand roll it. Uh, here, you get it for free. <clears throat> all right. And so this is for read transactions. Let's look for write. And as mentioned in the paper, for the writes, you actually also get the post images, the updates of the values. Um, I hope that makes sense. We are re restoring the read and the post images for uh, write transactions. All right. So, excuse me. All right. So, say that we we do not we should not read the uh, should read column is false. Then we got to do more work and we have to search the version vector. So, of course, here we have two checks and these are described. I, I, hopefully, uh, when we look at the implementation of this, uh, it'll reflect of what we have seen in the slides. <clears throat> All right, so first is, let's look at this. So this is the start and start and end check. So what this is, is we loop on the deltas uh, on the uh, on the version vector and try to find the first entry in the vector that satisfies this condition, where the transaction ID is between the start and end timestamp. That's all there is to it. But the interesting bit is, um, we are doing this in a in a um, in a loop. Um, so first things, this might seem too this some this might seem very expensive, but remember that we are storing our entries newest to oldest. So more often than not, you will hit the entry that you're looking for at the head or the upper region of your uh, uh, vector or list. So this is this 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 actually is not that bad. Um, the all right. So if if we do find that if this is true, if the status is true, we did find it, then we again update nothing special. If it's false, then we return from this, then we go ahead and do the second check. Um, so this is a little bit interesting. Um, and this is where the whole um, idea of adding the, uh, adding the negative or flipping the MSB comes into play. So let's look at this. Uh, so uh, we have some state, we, we are trying to update our version vector. This is a ref uh, and this is an update of a ref. Um, I will, if you, if you are reading this commentary, uh, you might understand what's happening. If not, I'll, I'll try to explain. Um, so here, 
we are trying to update our um so first let me just go let's let's forget about all this um extraneous stuff let's 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 just say that if this check passes say the current transaction is actually between the start and infinity then the first thing we need to do is create an ancestor right and then that ancestor will be the copy is actually the copy of the predecessor but with the start timestamp uh, negated because it's uncommitted once we have that we will create the child or the predecessor with an end timestamp uh, negated once we have that uh, we have to switch the pointers um, so what we do is we split the 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 current vector at an index where we found the entry and we update that this vector is still not visible to the world um, so we go ahead uh, and update the child pointer inside the vector once this is done you go ahead and make the global change so i want to i want to like talk a little bit about um, concurrency and visibility and all that good stuff because the 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 main complexity here is concurrency and visibility of these versions um, rather than like how it's being done. Um, so first, <clears throat> let's go back and understand why we are doing this. Um, so there are, there, are two, there are a couple of ways to do this. So the first approach that I was trying to do was, okay, the paper suggests everything should be cast-based. Um, I started looking at cast based linked list solutions and I landed up on an IBM site with, uh, which actually has an implementation of the cast based linked list. But there is the, if you read the whole, uh, like the, the set of blog posts or articles, what it talks about, it, it, it suggests going, uh, it suggests against using these uh, cast based um, uh, link list, the, and they, they go in great detail why not to do it. First, is it's very hard to reason about it. You might end up with like partial updates, or you will end up with like partial <coughs> visibility. Um, will, you, you, you could see threads having um, threads getting thread, threads able to look at partially updated uh, or corrupted data, which is not what you want for an. Uh, uh, a database. Second, the reason paper suggests CAS-based um, operations is because CAS-based operations cannot deadlock. That's the biggest, and that's the that's the reason people try to reach for them. Um, so, if so the, the ref abstraction, and it's common in CATS and in uh, Zio, if you take a ref abstraction and back it with a immutable data structure, you almost get, not almost, you get the, you get zero visibility issues because the data structure is immutable. You'll always have the complete uh, data structure and there's no way to have partial rights. You might have a wrong data in the data structure, but you'll never have uh, two threads reading uh, incomplete or partial data. That's one thing with using the, the idea of using a ref. Um, the, the, the other interesting bit here is um, this, uh, so the, so <clears throat> uh, remember I talked about um, the notion of the the the, the, the database hyper database having single write threads, and the reason for that is um, we have not looked at indexes. We have not looked at other database processes that actually go along with this garbage collection, etc. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> 
having a single thread uh, minimizes contention when it comes to all those other database objects and uh, processes, which makes uh, which makes not only the database performant but also the engineering that's involved uh, very simple or easy to manage. Not simple, but easy to manage. Anyways, so uh, this was a long-winded way of saying or talking about this because, because I feel like there is uh, a lot here and it some, sometimes get lost. Um, and the paper also, and there's a lot of literature that talks about um, CAS-based uh, data structures in databases. One of these reasons is this and why they are good and why they're bad. Anyway, so if we do this, we now have the, we've done this, this, um, all right. So we, we, we check the start, we do this check and we do this check. And if they both, if one of them passes, then um, we go ahead and we, we, during those checks, we actually go and update some internal state, which is again, adding stuff to the read and uh, write, um, the read set and the write set that we'll use for predicate validation. So once we have done this, uh, we we get we generate the commit timestamp. This is just again going and asking the counter for a value. Then you build the predicate space. <coughs> this in our read, excuse me. This in our read transaction would be getting the read set and the write set and adding them. Um, then we do the validation. Hopefully, this should be pretty straightforward now. Um, the only thing here interesting is the fact that we need to get the transactions that were committed during the lifespan of the transaction that is uh, under validation. So we need some, some mechanism to get those values, but it's not that hard. Um, once we have that, uh, then, it's, it's, then we basically go in and do our validation for read against read set, validation against write set. There's a bunch of to-dos, which hopefully uh, makes you understand uh, there's a lot of things that are missing, uh, but general idea and the implementation is there. Um, all right, so once we have this, uh, we could pass or fail, and then you know we could move on. Again, this is an iterable, um, so, Effectively, you, sh you should never get this value. All of the values that I get or the validation or transaction should get should be this. Um, <coughs> um, and it should, it should all work. The good thing or the heavy lifting is actually being done by the for each par from the, the zero, but I don't want to get into this for now. Anyways, so once you get the validation, you need to restamp your version vectors. Remember, once you get the, the commit timestamp, you go back, you re-timestamp re all your versions that had the, the MSB flipped. Um, once you do that, this is, again, nothing great. Read times, because this is effectively read, you don't do much here, because in read transactions, the commit timestamp is actually the start timestamp. Um, and yeah, so you don't need to do much there, but during the right transaction, you have to go and uh, update the the vector and update all the entries with the, uh, flip the MSV with the new commit type step. Okay, so once you do that, um, you set the, once you've done all this, you go ahead and set, set the value in the care column this is effectively, we, we already have, we've already looked at this. It's nothing special here again. You see, I have comments here about redo logs, garbage collection, which is another big one. Uh, then you update the version store. Now you want to make this visible globally so that all threads could see the updates that the current transaction has done. And you want to update the ledger. Um, and again, this is for the read. You'll actually go ahead and uh, uh, deleted from the active and update the recently committed transactions. Uh, and 
once you're done, you return the result of your valid validity and you're done. Um, hopefully, this was this gives you some idea of the implementation and uh, hopefully the, the slides actually add some context of uh, why we are doing all this and how it's all how it all ties ties back together to the paper. All right, let me share my oh, oh yeah, it's on the sixth slide. So you have two monitors. Let me share my slides again. All right. So just if I just a time check, how much time do I have? Uh, I generally don't mind how long you go. Go go for it as we're not at a physical venue where we're going to get kicked out. Yeah. So okay. go, go 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 as long as you you feel you need to. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so Zio, I touched upon this. Um, there's actually it's it's a very rich and complete uh, framework. And this is um, the, and uh, if, if I was doing a, a, a web application and if I had to choose a, a framework, I would choose this in a heartbeat. There is so much goodness in it. If folks have not seen, uh, I, would, I would highly recommend everyone to go and have a look. Uh, batteries included, again, I have not uh, shown the tests and the, the testing framework that comes along with it. It has its own generators, um, the execution model, the runner, everything is beautifully baked in. Uh, the, I feel one thing that's not so great about the Scala ecosystem is the choice paralysis. There is so much choice out there that, you know, I, I, like, I just want to, like, the, I want to implement the ideas in my head and not worry about what library or framework I have to deal with and the binary incompatibility and all those good things. So I think um, I could talk more about this, but that's a different talk. This is, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I was, I was, uh, I was very impressed uh, by, by uh, Zio. So I, I, I would dive, I would highly and definitely recommend anybody who wants to, um, uh, have a look, please do. Uh, improvements, oh boy. Um, things that I've not talked about um, and the paper actually just, just glosses over is <clears throat> indexes, garbage collection, testing, that's a big one. Like you, um, how do you test a database? You, you cannot just think of it as a crud. You, you have to be a little bit more, um, but you have to be a little bit better than that. Uh, I, I have a few ideas, but again, different. Uh, that's a different topic altogether. Data compression, recovery, retry issues. I haven't shown this, but uh, the the whole idea: if you your transactions have a uncommitted value, you have the, the you have the reset. All you have to do is you have to just check that. I have not added that, but the the retry. And I think this, this is very trivial to do in ZIO. <laughs> Excuse me. It exposes the whole schedule uh, abstraction. Uh, but yeah, this needs to be like, you know, thought through. One of the, like after implementing just the, the paper and the idea, the other thing that I, when, I, when I was sitting and thinking about how to test it, it, it and how to debug it, one thing became very clear was if you turn the implementation into a state machine, this becomes actually, um, it, it, it would help along in the testing and the, uh, the, the, implementa the implementation becomes much clearer. It tests in, it helps in testing and debug debugging the system as a whole. To just the general performance. Um, the, the literature and the paper talks about hardware. Um, there's, there's, the, there's other literature that talks about tying threads to CPU and then um, making sure that you, you do all the, uh, like you, you, your performance, um, you, you actually, okay, there's a better way to put this. 
you try to utilize the hardware to squeeze the performance um, by tying the threads to CPU, then you exporting the fact that you're running with this new architecture, you do not even go across cores on the socket in the on the chip. Um, there's like few other things that you know the when you start researching and reading about this, it's just um, it's very it's very interesting, but it's very hard to do on the JVM. Uh, the max that you could do on the JVM is basically um, on a machine have a CPU tied to a process, but that's most of that's that's the max that you could do. Um, yeah, there's like you know other stuff that I've missed, uh, but yeah, this 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 is like you know this if the this is the the the, the list of things that I, I would like to improve if I get a chance. Um, but with that, I would like to stop and complete this talk. Uh, and if there are questions, I'm happy to take them. Mm -hmm.